Good evening. I'd ask the uh, trustees to please uh, find their seats and for everyone else to please uh, get comfortable. I do want to welcome everyone to the board meeting of Monday, March 31st, 2014. Very happy to see uh, so many supporters of the people um, who are receiving acknowledgement through the prof profiling excellence today. So thank you to parents and friends and, and, um, uh, and others who have come to support you and look forward to uh, meeting some of you later. I do want to acknowledge that we do have in the audience today um, Councillor Robert Pasuta from uh, Ward 14. Very pleased that uh, Council is in Council. At least that's how we'll see you as a full representative. And um, we will, if you could, now that I've asked you all to sit down, ask you all to rise so that we can sing O Canada. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Please be seated and I'll call upon uh, Executive Superintendent Manny Figueredo. This is uh, Profiling Excellence and it's our opportunity to um, note and mention and acknowledge the accomplishments of our students who have been doing not just wonderful work as students in our organization, but who are doing wonderful things in our community, uh, in our province, and in some cases around the world. So um, the executive superintendent will uh, give us some introductions. Thank you. Uh through you, Madam Chair. Just to, so I'm clear on process, um, when I do recognize the students, they can come down. Reminder to parents and family members, if you'd like to take photos, please feel free to do so. And then the, the, the ward trustee will, I believe, hand the certificate to the, to the winner. Um, I would ask, uh, I would ask uh, Mr. Figueredo if people could come to this spot in front of me. And, um, and we have our photographer. Uh, to take some photos for us as well. Thank you for that. Okay. Well, th thank you, uh, through, uh, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to be introducing uh, this evening's recipients. Uh, Sharon Stefanian, my colleague, uh, who's ill tonight with the flu, was unable to be here. So I was able to obtain um, her notes and some information on most of the students here tonight. And I, I apologize, I did touch base with most. And, and if I haven't, um, I'm gonna, don't have any information on, on you. I'm gonna um, definitely make sure we call you down and hopefully I can get some key points about you. And you can also feel free to share them. So without any further ado, I will start. Um, I'd like to begin with uh, Felicia Benito. I don't, didn't check her name off. I don't know if Felicia Benetto is here this evening. She's not. Uh, she's a grade 12 student at Ancaster High, and she's being recognized this evening for her Peace Medal nominee. Thank you. All right. Uh, we have Ryan Morton. He's grade 12, student at Sir Winston Churchill, and being nominated for Peace Medal winner. And I know he is here this evening, so I've checked him off my list, and I was able to chat with him. So as Ryan's making his way down, Ryan, according, this was sent by Ryan's school, demonstrates incredible support for his students in his school community. He regularly attends school events, both at the school and held across the city. He is a member of the Churchill Chariots, a group that focuses on providing peer support for other students, so a great peer leader. Um, Ryan also organized and implemented the 
November campaign at Sir Winston Churchill to educate his fellow students. And he wears his uniform proud and educators and, um, uh, and other students about armed forces. He educates people about their mission in Hamilton and their focus through Hamilton's Road Canada. So congratulations, Ryan, this evening. Next, we have Rebecca Sampson, uh, who's here this evening, grade 12 student at Sherwood, who is also a Peace Medal nominee. I had a chance to speak uh, to Rebecca. Uh, Rebecca said she, she was nominated for this, and I was also had a chance to speak to her mother, because she was on a panel for fostering a community of respect. And on this panel were many community members, and uh, she represented uh, this panel at her local temple. And she said her role was to bring the youth perspective of how um, people can work against hatred in the community. And her perspective was around cyberbullying and how she indicated sometimes young hide behind the internet and how it's something that she's taken advocate and, and, and been an avid leader in her, in her school community. Also, the Spectator had an article about her and, and her initiative. And she belongs in the Social Justice Club at school and continues to volunteer in her community and at her temple. So congratulations. Next, we have uh, Kathleen McBaron, who's a grade 12 student at Ancaster High, being nominated for the Jeff Dickens Award. And I believe she's here. Yeah. She is mentioned here. She said, I've been interested in trying nearly everything under the sun since I was about two years old. Whether it's a sport, a hobby, or a school subject, I've attempted just about everything. The balance of schoolwork, volunteering, and extracurriculars has always been a common theme in, in her life, she says. With all these experiences, I've been able to narrow my passions to science, business, performing arts, and competitive golfing. That's a narrow focus. <laughs> it's wonderful. So she plans to continue this balance of grades, community, and sports at university next year, at the same time pursuing many of her passions. And she's looking forward to the new experience and the new learnings in university. Congratulations. Our next uh, winner is Layla Dawson that we're profiling tonight. I didn't get a chance to meet her, so I don't know if Layla is here this evening. I don't think so, but she's a grade 12 student at Ancaster High, and she's um, being recognized this evening uh, for the Reverend John C. Holland Award nominee. We'll make sure she gets her certificate. Okay. Next, we have uh, Zainab Hussain, grade 12 student at Westdale the winner of the Reverend John C. Holland Award. I didn't meet him, as, didn't meet this person either this, uh, this evening, so I don't know if they've made their way here. If not, we'll make sure they get their uh, award and recognition. Next, we have uh, Jackson Virgin Holland, who I did meet. And Jackson can make his way down. Jackson's here with his mother this evening. He's being recognized this um, evening for the Reverend John C. Holland Award as a winner. And he's a grade 12 student at Westdale. Um, I also had the pleasure of meeting uh, Jackson. He's not being recognized this evening, but he will. He was also the winner of the Hamilton Spectator Youth Volunteer Award. And when I saw him, he said, oh, geez, that, that speech. And I said, well, that was probably one of the best speeches I have heard. And he said, do you really think so? I said, yes, I do. And he said, why? I said, because it was heartfelt and it was authentic. So I want to read a little bit more about what the school had sent about Jackson here. I think I have some notes here. And I just have to find him, Jackson, but I, I apologize. Actually, Jackson might want to do your speech. It's probably better than mine. <laughs> I apologize. Here we go. Here we go, Jackson. Um, Jackson Virgin Holland is a grade 12 student. Throughout his high school education, Jackson has demonstrated a dedication to academic excellence great leadership, potential, and a consistent commitment to community service. He's a confident young man who exemplifies the personal qualities that we foster, a determined work ethic guided by a strong sense of integrity and respect. He's also demonstrated incredible commitment to serving the community and volunteerism. He serves as a representative of the Hamilton Wentworth District School Board's Black History Committee and the Hamilton Youth Advisory Committee. So congratulations this evening, Jackson.
Next, I have uh, Titus Chiadi. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Titus is here. He introduced himself earlier to me this evening. Come on down, Titus, and thank you for being here. Titus is a grade 12 student at Sir John A. Macdonald, and he was a nominee for the Reverend John C. Holland Award. The school described Titus as a very conscientious student who cares a great deal about humanitarian issues. He demonstrates this on numerous occasions and a willingness to get actively involved in standing up for what is right. Last year, Titus came uh, to the school, I believe was a principal, with a letter seeking assistance in wording as it was to be sent to the Ontario Minister of Education. I believe it was to express his view that she must support teachers' rights to conduct extracurriculars as they see best. He's also a very moral student and is an active member of the Sir John A. Macdonald History Club. He's also involved in Canadian Educational Development Agency through the federal government and some missionary work. So congratulations this evening. Next we have Alexia Rook Rookwood, and I know she's here this evening. Alexia is a grade 12 student at Orchard Park and is a winner of the Reverend John C. Holland Award. I asked Alexia this evening um, why she thought she was nominated for this award. What did people recognize in her to nominate her for this award? She said she um, belongs in a club around the holiday season in her school. And for, during the holiday season, they had a, um, an issue called Change for Change. And in this initiative, she was one of the leaders who ensured that every classroom had a jar. And with this jar, students were asked to bring in change to support the local community. And she said last year they raised 700, and this past year they raised 600. And with, the, with these funds, they use this money to purchase gifts and to give those families who are, who are less fortunate uh, gifts so they could also have a great holiday season. So thank you very much, and congratulations. Next, we have Sharon Shaji, grade 12 student from Ancaster. I don't think she's is she here this evening. She made her way. Great. I didn't get a chance to meet her. I'm glad she's here. Um, yes. And she's a, a nominee for the Reverend John C. Holland Award. Um, Sharon, from a young age, uh, she wrote here, I've discovered that I love to get out there in the community and help in the smallest ways possible. It started with simple things such as taking part of the cancer walk and the pilgrimage walk with Christ, raising money for third world nations. From there, it has escalated, she said to me, currently volunteering at the hospital, the Canadian blood bank, teaching dance and coaching soccer. Since I've been volunteering at the dialysis for a couple of years, she said, I've been able to create a connection with my, with my regular patients, and it's a rewarding feeling. Uh, throughout these various activities, both in the community and school, I've been able to become a critical thinker, step out of my comfort zone, and take on many leadership roles, which have taught me to only better myself. It's important for me to always try my best and push myself to my full potential and balance all these sports and activities with my academics. Congratulations, Sharon. being guided well by these students. Okay, next we have um, Tanya Joseph, grade 10 student from Sir Alan McNabb, who's, who's also a nominee for the Hamilton Spectator Youth Volunteer of the Year Award. <laughs> Tanya Joseph is a young woman who exemplifies the qualities of discipline, leadership, and commitment according to her school. She has given over 1,100 hours in volunteering at her school community and the community at large, and she is only in her second year of high school. Tanya finds time 
to play at a high level on the school girls volleyball team and on the badminton team while also excelling academically in the rigorous advanced placement program in McNabb. She's a powerhouse of unwavering dedication, passion for her community, and enthusiasm in all she accomplishes. Congratulations, Ty, on your award this evening. Next is uh, Monica Nagin. I don't know if she's here this evening. A grade 12 student at Glendale. Also a nominee for the Hamilton Spectator Youth Volunteer of the Year Award. We'll make sure she gets her award. Next we have uh, Kate Sturicker, grade 12 Orchard Park student. No, she's here. And also a nominee for the Hamilton Spectator Youth Volunteer of the Year Award. I had the pleasure of meeting Kate also at that evening. And um, I remember in my conversation with her that she was um, volunteering actively at uh, St. Joseph's. And you're going to help me with this word, um, Kate. What, what is it exactly? Where do you volunteer in? So I said, wow, you're going to go to the medical field. And you said, oh, for engineering. But she said that volunteer experiences has broadened her perspective and given her insight to what she really wants to follow in her passion. So she's also on um, Reach for the Top team at her school as a leader there, and she's excited because she just got accepted into University of Waterloo into the engineering program. So congratulations, Kate, and thank you. Okay, next we have... Michelle Zimatoriski, do I pronounce that right? No, thank you, Michelle. She'll help me. <laughs> oh, I love the honesty. So, Michelle, help me pronounce your last name properly. Zitomiski, is that better? Okay. <laughs> She's a great 12 student at Highland, and I also had a chance of meeting her at the Hamilton Spectator Youth Volunteer of the Year Award. She was a nominee. This is what some people at your school said about you, Michelle. A very active volunteer and fundraiser for the SPCA. She has also volunteered at Hamilton's Out of the Cold, St. Joseph's Hospital, and McMaster's Venture Science Camp. Most recently, she became a World Vision Youth Ambassador. She's a, a co-chair of the World Awareness Committee, Minister of Fundraising for Student Council, and has been a leader at Highlands Annual Leadership Camp. Michelle plans to use her skills and dedication to study arts and science with the goal of eventually becoming a neurologist. Congratulations. <laughs> Next we have Emily Farrell. She's a grade 8 student at Hillcrest. and She's being profiled this evening for her um, poster design for the Bullying Awareness Week. I know she's here this evening. had a chance to speak to Emily when she arrived and asked her to describe her poster and she said she drew a picture of a brick wall and on the brick wall she had the words stand up, speak up and break the silence. And um, I asked her why she chose to use the image of a brick wall with these terms. She said in her art club in her school that she's involved in, they had been learning how to do graffiti art. So she thought of combining the learning in her, in her art club with this bullying campaign. And um, she said she believe, she's proud of it and she really believes it has an impact because it caught the attention of her classmates and staff. So congratulations. And um, she co-created that with someone else we're going to bring down a little later this evening. So congratulations. Uh, Katre Sai Haseg, I don't know if she's here this evening. I didn't get a chance to touch base. Grade 11 student at Glendale, also being profiled this evening for the poster design for Bullying Awareness Week. We'll make sure she gets her award.
Next, from Hillcrest, we have Irene Pagu Basson. And I know I said that right because it took her three times slowly to pronounce her last name and to break it down for me. So thank you, Irene. Please come down. She's also being recognized for her poster design for Bullying Awareness Week. Well, I, when I introduced Emily, I, I described Emily's poster of the brick wall and the saying. Well, Emily and, I, and Irene, in the spirit of, our, uh, of collaboration, co-created this poster and worked on it together and are both being recognized this evening. So what I loved was Emily said, make sure you recognize Irene, because I co-created this. I didn't do this on my own. So thank you, Irene, for being here, and congratulations to both of you. And um, Yes, um, Superintendent Figueredo, before we move on to the staff um, oh, yes. portion of this, I just... Just wondering if anyone has come in um, since their names had been called. Yes, I. You do have Madam some Chair, names. We'll, we'll ask. But I believe there's a Layla Dawson who's oh, wonderful. here, but there might be some other another person who's here. If anyone else has come in since yeah. I've started, please make sure you signal your name and come down and see me, and we'll make sure we recognize you. But I believe this is Layla Dawson coming from. Am I correct? Grade 12 student from Ancaster High, who's also being uh, recognized at, for her nominee, uh, being, nomination, being nominated for the Reverend John C. Holland Award. And I'll find her sheet. Thank you for your patience. Um, okay, thank you. Layla, it's written here that throughout her high school career that she has been interested in many things including photography and imagery, as well as maintaining a good academic standing. She says, I find that with graduating this year, I'm truly passionate about sports and volunteer work. I feel as though being involved in different activities keeps me connected to the students and community of Ancaster and beyond. In the near future, I plan to attend university and study international business. I intend to become more internationally minded by traveling and, document, and documenting my world travels. So congratulations. Just making sure there's no, no other students here that we've... Well, now I'd like to move to the, to the back of our agenda. We have a section on staff that we profiled this evening. Uh, I know that Allison Kemper, who's here from Hillcrest, uh, is being recognized for her poster design for Bullying Awareness Week. And I'm going to find the sheet. Sorry. What looks slow. That is really slow. Here's, here's some information on Allison. She wrote, the poster for Bowling Awareness Week was uh, the first assignment to kick off my drawing club at Hillcrest School. So this is, the, this is the club the other students were referring to. The artist had to communicate what bowling looks like, how it makes people feel, and what students can do to stop it in their schools. The contest opened up dialogue in the drawing club and created a positive climate where students felt comfortable sharing how bullying has affected them. So this, is, this was written by your vice principal, Sarah Goodman. So thank you very much for your contribution, Allison, and, and for giving of your time for these students. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Figueredo, and uh, thank you uh, to all the students and the staff who have been in this room so that we can acknowledge the wonderful work and leadership you show in our community. We have people here who uh, are committed to global peace, um, who recognize the um, historical and political and important, uh, uh, community importance of John C. Holland and have followed his path uh, with leadership in their community. 
uh, to all the nominees and winners of those awards, congratulations for the work you do and for the leadership model that you set for all students and for all the rest of us. Uh, to those who have volunteered thousands of hours and, and have only been nominated uh, for the award, uh, I am so pleased and delighted that you're able to give your energies and talents to this community. Uh, we certainly need it and you are giving it and thank you very much for doing so. And then to the people who've been working on the bullying aware, uh, awareness uh, project, to the staff person who created the space for people to feel welcome to do the work, and for students to find ways to show leadership that we too, as individuals, can stop bullying. So I really appreciate all the tremendous work all of you have done, and I wonder if the trustees will join me in congratulating you all again. We now go to uh, our first item of business, not the absol absolute pleasure we just had, but the approval of the agenda. And just before we go there, I do have regrets, do I not? Uh, not me personally, but uh, Trustee Petal is not here, just uh, to note that. Um, and so I'd be... <laughs> you will have in front of you um, a revised agenda which is in yellow, so I'll be happy to receive a motion for the approval of the revised agenda. Yes, uh, Trustee Glauser, uh, seconded by Trustee Bishop. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, looking over the, uh, minute, uh, the agenda for this evening, uh, I do ask again if there are any uh, declarations of conflict of interest uh, from an, any member of the board. Not seeing any, let us move then to the confirmation of the minutes for February 24th, 2014. I have a motion to confirm those minutes. Thank you, uh, Trustee Simmons. Do I have a seconder for that? Trustee White, all those in favor? Thank you very much. Um, I then would like to call down, if I may, the um, presentation from West Flamborough Area Review um, Committee. We, we do have some happy people outside, which is always nice. Um, and I just want to bring to uh, trustees' awareness, I, I, I did notify you of this matter. But uh, in our uh, efforts to be sure that people are included and have the opportunity to speak to us on their presentation, uh, somewhere uh, last week we missed the uh, West Flamborough Committee. And uh, my apologies to them again. Uh, and we're uh, resolving that issue by having them make their presentation tonight. Thank you for your indulgence in this matter. And. Um, it will be essentially the same material that we have seen, but it will give us, uh, give them the opportunity to speak directly to us. Uh, so without uh, any further introduction, um, Mr. Del Bianco, please uh, thank introduce your guests. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, once again, I apologize for any miscommunication that we may have had internally, um, but we are happy this evening to have two members from the West Flamborough Accommodation Review presenting their recommendation. This evening we have Candice Goodale, Candice, as well as Kristen Glassen, Glass Glassbergen. Glassbergen. Sorry, Manny, uh, you're much better at this than I am. Um, so without further ado, um, the presentation from the ARC members.
Uh, over 90% utilized through 2022. Mill Grove's utilization will remain at mid 70 percentile. Uh, so that's the main difference um, with the, the part, part two. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this because it's very similar to what you just saw. One of the things we really talked about a lot on the ARC committee and in the public meetings was um, non-permanent construction. Uh, the, but all the communities, the whole of West Monroe was really, um, was not interested in portables and port packs. We really wanted our children to be at a brick, brick and mortar completed school. So that's something that we um, thought was a big priority. Program offerings. The ARC committee must consider program offerings, each with their own specific requirements at each location. Two schools will be JK to 8 and one school will be JK to 5. All students will continue to have the same access to program, extracurricular and learning resources. Transportation remains the same as the 2A um, scenario. So does partnership um, opportunities and equity. So to sum up, two new JK to 8, 350 pupil pace school, one for Beverly Central and C Dr. Seaton schools students, and one for Greensville and Spencer Valley students, and then Millgrove re re remains status quo. Didn't ex explain at the beginning <laughs> that the scenario, our, our recommendation for um, Beverly Central and Dr. Seaton remains the same for both parts. I think that's, I didn't mention that, but I think that was clear. And then the funding, um, that's, okay. And so in summary, our two part recommendation, part one, the closure of Beverly Central and Dr. Seaton in June, 2016, build a new 350 place replacement school school on the Beverly Community Center site. That's our preferred site. Uh, if that is not viable, then a new school on the Beverly Central School site. Uh, and part 2A for your um, part of the um, boundary, the closure of Greensboro, Millgrove, and Spencer Valley uh, in Ju June 2016 and build a new 525 pupil place school on the Spencer Valley site that is not viable, part 2B, uh, the closure of Greensville and Spencer Valley in June 2016, build a new 350 place, pupil place school on the Spencer Valley site and Millgrove remains status quo. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Del Bianco, we, uh, we're just going to have the committee present. I just want to just to clear up the misunderstanding. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Candace and Kristen, for present and making your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe the delegation night for West Flamborough um, Arc Committee uh, for the uh, for the board. Um, to receive delegations from the public and from community agencies and individuals is, uh, um, is that a Monday? Tuesday, April 29th. Thank you very much for that. We'll now move to reports from special committees um, and allowing her to get a little glass of water. I will then move to the chair of governance, um, Alex Johnstone. Evening and through the chair, it is my pleasure to present the governance report. Um, I guess I'd like to, us to vote first on two items before proceeding to, um, I guess, an update on the on the other committee business. So um, the first item is a motion that I'd like to put forward. Um, so that was originally put forward by Trustee Bishop, and that was uh, recommendations A and B, um, so which is 
A, that's Section 2.01 of the Government's Governance Statement Committee or Community Advisory Committee be revised by deleting the words in con consultation with trustees. B, that Section 2.09 of the Governance Statement Community Advisory Committee be revised by changing the wording to under normal circumstances, a member who has served, who has uh, served um, services for more than two consecutive terms or partial terms shall be replaced by a new member. However, the board may approve that an individual member be appointed for more than two consecutive terms or partial terms. I'll need a seconder. And you're moving that? Yep. Do I have a seconder to that? Uh, Trustee Bishop, thank you. Um, yes, Trustee Johnstone. Did so, you want to speak to the motion? So speaking to the motion, um, I just would like to remind, I guess, trustees of the new process, which is um, that we're, re we're reading from our, um, I guess, the packages that we initially receive um, with all of the uh, minutes and, and uh, reports from, from each committee. Um, so I guess, uh, uh, if, however, uh, trustees are in need of more information tonight, I have asked Heather to put, a, put it together on an electronic U USB stick so we can pull it up on screen if, for this one time, um, if trustees should need more, I guess, fuller context of these two amendments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trustee Bishop. Madam Chairman, these are really cosmetic uh, changes to the to the governance um, to the community community advisory committee's terms of reference. Um, the, the the significance of Section 209 and the changes there are that there are some committees where, in fact, it would be very difficult to replace them with an, uh, an and to have terms on those committees. I'm thinking particularly of the First Nations, Métis and Inuit committee where there are two elders sitting on the committee and we only have two elders in this community. So it would, so Section 209 allows us to retain their membership and the services of the elders in, in the committee and in other circumstances in other committees as well. So Madam Chairman, I do not see these as big changes. They're, they're ones that will make the committees work. Yes, uh, Trustee White and then Trustee Orban. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have, uh, I, I agree with the two uh, speakers, the mover and seconder, that these are rather cosmetic and a result of some of the feedback that we heard from FIAC and uh, rural schools as well as uh, the FM and I uh, committee as well. Uh, there were two further issues that were raised, um, I believe by Trustee Turkster and myself when we saw this last, and that was around the purpose of a two-year term as indicated in the terms of reference. So for instance, with rural schools, it's based on a school year and it's based off of the school council chair or school council members for that year. So it would not be a two-year term. Um, so there was a suggestion at the time that it be one or two-year term because it would suit the committee. There was a second issue um, and that was around the concept that the current terms of reference follows our elected year, which is December through November. And there was a desire that it follow the school calendar instead from September to September. Uh, so Madam Chair, I would like to move two amendments on these issues to add those two items. So perhaps I'll do one at a time so it's clear. Yes, that would be my preference, uh, Trustee White. So Madam Chair, I'd like to move that the, the terms of reference be modified to indicate one or two year term. Uh, can you uh, tell me where you would put that? It's referenced throughout, oh, so it would be a C in the motion, first of all, so we have A and B, so it would be C in the motion. Um, and in terms of the terms of reference, it is periodically referenced throughout, so it would have several places in the policy that would change, um, but the intent of the motion is that it would be formatted as such to reflect one or two years. Okay, and that would be for that would be the uh, standard template for every community advisory committee. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Do I have a seconder for that, uh, Trustee Turkstra? So I have White and Turkstra. Uh, you've spoken to it, I would believe, Trustee White. Did you wish to speak uh, a little further to it, and then I can go to Trustee Turkstra? Yeah, the only thing I would add is, is once again, there are minor tweaks like the the first two items A and B. So this isn't a radical change. I think it just allows a little bit more flexibility depending on the advisory committee. So it doesn't change anything unless it suits that advisory committee. So it just adds a little bit of 
flexibility. For that, uh, Trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I just want to reinforce that I support uh, exactly what uh, Trustee White is purporting because it's for our, our communities that follow our year, that they follow their own. A lot of flexibility in that term uh, that they're serving. Um, so I'm, for all the same reasons. Thank you. Anyone else to the amendment, please? Uh, I saw Trustee Orban's uh, hand earlier. Is it to this amendment or is it to another matter? On the motion, the main motion? Uh, we'll have to come back to that, Trustee Orban. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Johnstone, then. I'd just like to share with trustees that um, item 2.07 reads that the term of office for a member of the Community Advisory Committee shall be two years um, I guess commencing on December 1st and ending on November 30th. So I guess technically that is the, it's 2.07 that would need to change. Um, and then also we're just, I guess there's some debate over at this end about whether, whether it is necessary or not. Um, just because part B does talk about two or more, or um, more than two consecutive terms. So applying that there could be one. So is it, are you looking maybe for clear language or is implied? Trust, can you respond to that? Thank you, Madam Chair. The, on the first question, this amendment on the floor right now is not in terms of the December through November. This motion that I have on the floor right now is regards to in regards to um, one or two year term. I will move the second one if this one passes. Um, to the second question on the policy reflects this. It, it, it does indicate only a two-year term except for when a committee is uh, started or when it begins. Members would have the choice of a one or two-year term when it begins. But beyond that, the policy is clear that it's a two-year term, not one or two, beyond startup. I, I, um, Trustee Johnstone, I see that um, the amendment is meant to be understood differently than 207. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Trustee Simmons. Hi, um, just that clarification. Do I understand correctly that a committee member can then, when they, become, when they come on the committee, can choose a one or a two-year term? You let me ask the question then. Um, Trustee White. They would indicate their preference, but each member is selected through the director's uh, uh, discretion and recommended to the board for appointment. So they may indicate that to the director. It would be to the director's discretion on what he recommends, and then would be our final uh, recommendation, our final decision on what we choose. But we are open to two-year terms. That's the intent. Um, but based on rural schools and other advisory committees, uh, the preference may be one. So we want to make that choice clear. You, uh, for that, uh, Trustee Simmons. And uh, how does the amendment, uh, I guess, and you're referring to rural schools, um, how does that sort of help our situation with these committees to, to have this as opposed to somebody just dropping off after a year? Or, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Trustee Simmons, I didn't hear that last part. How, how does this improve? Um, needs for our committees and our community um, with putting this option in. I, and I, I'm just trying to understand um, how, it, how it makes it better. Okay, thank you for that. Trustee White and then... Um... Yeah, the, the simple example for that question is, is rural schools. I keep using rural schools because action. I mean, this applies to all, particularly, you know, FIAC as well. But using the rural example, it's based on school council. So each year, as of September or June, there's a significant turnover on that committee. If we do not reappoint the new members until December, they can't start up until mid-December. And we know that a lot of new committees do not begin their work right at Christmas. So really, they lose September through December to actually do the work of the committee um, once their members drop off. So this allows them to hit the ground running in September or October, what happens to be their first organizational meeting of the school year. Thank you. I'm going to go to Trustee Glauser. Are you on this amendment? 
Thank you. Bishop? Okay. I, I support that it would start in September. I also think that I like the idea of the option because sometimes you lose members at the end of one year and or if everybody started on the same year and at the end of two years you lost them all does not give you very good continuity for your committees so if you can actually have staggered starts actually works better uh, uh, trustee glauser this amendment is only until uh, is only referring to the one or two year not what month that this starts on yes thank you for that uh, trustee bishop Madam Chairman, um, these issues were discussed by the Governance Committee um, and uh, we also noted that the Rural Advisory Committee usually does not meet until after um, the beginning of, uh, I believe it does not usually meet until um, very late in the fall uh, or in January and usually only has two meetings. The French Advisory Committee, um, uh, I, I believe, has monthly two uh, um, meetings every two months and um, with parents on them and uh, that also was thought with a two-year term you, you would you could carry over people who, who were not um, elected so so in essence madam chairman having a one or two-year term isn't a big issue and I, I, I'm um, I think I will be supporting this thank you um... My apologies, I may have missed the hand, or have I got all the hands? Anyone else to speak on the amendment? Uh, moved by Trustee White, uh, seconded by Trustee Turkstra, that there would be an option of one or two year terms. Added to the uh, Community Advisory Committee terms of reference, all those in favor? That is unanimous, thank you all very much. Trustee uh, Orban. References, uh, just for clarification, Madam Chair, references were made. Uh, not, not all committees, or is this, it says uh, community advisory committees. So we're talking uh, both of the rural and are we talking about the urban. So. Um, it, it, to me, it's complicated. Why don't we just put it into those, those two uh, references? Yeah, just um... no, because see, when I look at A, there's community advisory committees by deleting the words. So I gather this applies for all committees, including rural, when it comes to deleting consultation. So just so to answer your question, we do not current, currently have a, uh, an urban uh, community advisory committee. Yes, you would. But we have a rural a community advisory committee. We have a French, uh, sorry, no, we do have French, French immersion. Yep. We have First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. Um, there's a fourth one. No, I'm making up another one. Um, so it refers very specifically to certain kinds of committees that we've just uh, created uh, some months ago called community advisory committees. And our discussion here is about the general template of terms of reference for the, all of those committees. So, Chair, now I'm going to ask the question. So are you saying all the committees could choose to serve for two years? As that's, uh, to me, that's where the confusion lies. If you're trying to make the terms of reference all committees equally, uh, that isn't what I hear. I hear now there are choices. So I want to ask clarification uh, if, if that's the situation. Talking specific. I'm talking about all terms of reference. So now. Okay, I think I'll go to the chair of governance okay, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Trustee Johnstone. Thank you for the question, Trustee Orban. So the, what has been changed is just the terms of reference for French immersion, uh, rule, and uh, First Nations community committees. It's only for those three committees, not for every single committee that the board has. So, 
I kind of asked what the intent is, but I guess I didn't get that message with regard to all, because the statement says advisory, com community advisory committees. All advisory committees. With regard to uh, some of Yes, um, Trustee Johnstone. Um, mainly because this report only deals with those three committees. We're still working on the terms of reference for the other committees. Um, so, and that is actually included in my further report under item three. Uh, so those other committees are still being worked on at present, uh, but we've only dealt with to date uh, the community advisory committees. I hope that clarifies things. Okay. Okay, if we could then move on, uh, Trustee White. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just would like to move the second amendment. It doesn't require much uh, description, but um, as previously discussed, I'd like to move that uh, the advisory committee's terms of reference follow the school year calendar. I'll speak briefly to it. I have a seconder. Let's see if we get get you a seconder yes uh, trustee Turkstra I'll go to the mover and seconder yeah, Thank so you. just speaking on uh, this question I, I said it before but essentially what this allows committees to do is to hit the ground running in September October whatever their first meeting is so for instance I'll use FIAC as an example this time they're for they've had they have two meetings before December um, this would allow them to have those two meetings if they had a significant drop-off in June um, and we stick with the current uh, appointment date they will not be up and running until December or January so what this allows them to do is to hit the ground running and advise us um, which is what we're asking them to do uh, to the seconder um, trustee Turkstra well just simply that community advisory committees should follow the school year, not the trustee elected electoral period. Uh, so for simple reasons, it makes sense. Thank you. Uh, trustee Johnstone, I saw your hand. Thank you uh, for, I guess, um, we did actually, the, the committee did discuss this thoroughly and there is a uh, a vibrant conversation that took place. One of the issues that did come up and why we decided to stick with um, uh, the dates that we, we currently have is the fact that school councils are not chosen until September. So realistically, parents and community members would not have the opportunity to, um, to then be elected or to find out about these committees or be offered the opportunity to participate until October at the very earliest. So we were trying to think about, um, about what was the law, I guess, when parents were being um, joining the school councils and when they would be reasonably finding out about information to participate in these communities, in these committees. Thank you, Trustee Johnstone, Trustee Bishop. Madam Chairman, we also discussed that this, these advisory committees are to advise the Board of Trustees. The term of the Board of Trustees is from November until, um, yes, December till November. And if, if um, so uh, you'll remember that that is also the way in which our statutory advisory committees are appointed, like our Special Education Advisory Committee is appointed with those terms as well. So. It's, it's awkward to have in a community advisory committee which, whose term does not finish at the same time as the term of trustees to which they are giving advice. And that was, was also another concern. We, there's absolutely no reason why a committee um, um, where, where there are school council chairs, as in the, front, in the rural advisory committees, um, they won't have been appointed until September, but in the rural advisory committee's um, case, they will not be meeting usually until January, and there's another meeting in the year. But, but usually there's, there's, there's two meetings um, 
uh, of the Rural Advisory Committee, and there's time for those school council chairs to be in place. Um, with the French Immersion Advisory Committees, if you have a two-year term, then there's an opportunity for some carryover um, uh, from one year to another. Um, because there, the French Immersion Advisory Committee has members who are elected by cluster, not um, on school council chairs. As for the French Immersion, as for the, I'm sorry, FNMI, the French First Nations Métis Inuit Committee, those members um, that there are, are, are from, drawn from several different parts. Um, a lot, there are community members, there are, um, there are two, two elders, there are members who are members of, of um, um, native organizations, and then there are parents, and they're also going to be students as well. But I think, although it's not perfect, either way has, has its problems. Um, trustees may decide that it's better to start in September, but there is this, this problem that our term runs in a particular format as well. Thank you, Trustee Bishop. White. before we conclude with the, the mover being none uh, then to uh, trustee white thank you and just to mention one further example I know we mentioned FIAC um, but perhaps you could use the example of probably the most friendly parent committee and that would be the parent involvement committee who use the school calendar and they prep their new members in June um, in, in, uh, in order to get ready for the new school year also have one or two year terms so you could argue that this is quite parent friendly seen as that is the process for our parent involvement committee oh uh, yes uh, trustee Turkstra I had asked for last speakers before uh, a concluding uh, comment from the mover okay um, people ready to vote then on uh, the this amendment that would start the uh, community advisory committees on the school year calendar rather than December to November, which is the trustee term year. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment. Trustee Turkstra, Glauser, White, student trustee Van, oh, I'm sorry, trustee Mulholland, trustee Orban, I'm sorry. I'm gonna ask everybody to put their hand, please everybody. Let's try again. This is to the amendment. Please put it, think first, how do you want to vote? And then please put up your hand. All of those in favor of the amendment. Thank you very much. Trustee Turkstra, <laughs> Glauser, Orban, Mulholland, White, student trustee Van Egdom, uh, student trustee Susick. Thank you, all those opposed. Brennan, Bishop, Johnstone, and Simmons, and Hicks. Is lost. Thank you all. I just had to take my socks off and do some counting. So we have had one amendment, which we kind of liked. We had another amendment, which we're not sure about. So to the main motion, uh, uh, as amended, which now includes clause C, um, uh, originally, uh, you may remember, originally moved by Trustee Johnstone, seconded by Trustee Bishop, uh, and that is A, B as written, and then C, which was the amendment regarding one and two year term. All those in favor, please think about things before you vote. Thank you very much, that is unanimous. Yes, Trustee Johnstone. Thank you, Madam Chair. So to continue through to the report to item two, uh, student trustee selection process, we are currently in um, uh, the process of um, this year's student trustee uh, election. And um, uh, we're also reviewing the student trustee election for future years. So that's currently 
in the process. Uh, item three, uh, trustee special committees terms of reference. So we did go through, uh, or partially anyway, through policy committee terms of reference. Um, due to lack of time, we're going to be having further discussion at our next committee uh, in April, and all of you are invited to, to join us as always. Uh, to item four, rules and regulations handbook. Um, Chair Brennan assures me that the handbook is just minutes away, and so we are looking forward to receiving that soon. Um, and uh, Glossy uh, wrapping paper with ribbons on it. Uh, sounds wonderful. Um, and uh, to the last item, the code of conduct. Uh, we haven't been able to get to the code of conduct yet this year. Uh, we do have it as an uh, uh, item of prominence on our April agenda. So again, if this is an item that you're interested in discussing, please do join us at uh, Governance Committee this, uh, this upcoming month. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we had a mover and a seconder for the report. Uh, to the rest of the report, to, to receive the report, all those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Oh, um, at the Special Education Advisory Committee report. Yes, uh, Trustee Bishop. Move, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Trustee Bishop. Uh, do I have a seconder for that? Trustee Hicks? This is to recommend to the board that Fran uh, Dudeman be appointed the new representative for the community living Hamilton for the upcoming, uh, on SEAC during this uh, term. All those in favor? Thank you, that too is unanimous. Yes, I'll accept a motion for us to move into a uh, private session. Uh, Trustee Glauser, seconded by Trustee Simmons. All those in favor? Um, Trustee Turkstra, Glauser, Hicks, Orban, White, Brennan, Bishop, Johnstone, Student uh, Trustee Van Egden, Student Trustee Suzik, Trustee Simmons, those opposed? Trustee Maholland. Uh, the motion carries. Thank you very much. For those of you who are in the audience, um elections, determination, relations. Uh, so this is affirmation of our uh, ward breakdown of 11 trustees appointed across 15 wards. Item number seven is the naming of the new South Secondary School. We do that. 
and get a seconder for uh, the motion uh, from Trustee White, ex excluding item seven. Uh, do, uh, Trustee Turkstra? All right. Okay, I, I think uh, we're moving into some areas. I just need to be sure I have a seconder for the whole report, and then we'll do the separation. Yes, Trustee Turkstra, thank you. And, and you're inter you would like to see item nine separated. Is that correct? Did I understand that? And the standing committee report. Okay, so to all, to the report except items seven and nine, I have mover, sorry, yes, trustee. Re uh, I actually assumed it was 9A. Let me go back, thank you for the, yeah, let me uh, go back to the um, person who suggested it was 9A. Sorry, thank you for that. Thank you, uh, trustee Mulholland. The separated was, Trustee Hicks, so let me go to you, Trustee Hicks. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, speaking against uh, the motion that was uh, accepted, um, I firmly believe that um, everybody's name should be considered with the same uh, background and information. Just because one name was not dealt with, in my opinion, and I asked the question during uh, the standing committee and I got the answer, that uh, E.A. Hutton was not considered. Uh, people had submitted the names, but the committee did not consider it because he was a principal at Hill Park. And I really have some real concerns with that. So as, I'm sorry, uh, Trustee Hicks, I did let you go on without actually a mover and a seconder. What are you actually asking I'm for voting item seven? I'm voting against the, the oh, motion. Okay, my I'm apologies giving, for giving that. I reason, thought you were perhaps... Reason why. Okay, thank you, Trustee Hicks. Please continue. Uh, Mr. Hutton was uh, at Hill Park some 50 years ago, and I really can't see this, uh, the, the rationale behind not considering E.A. Hutton for the name of that school. Secondly, uh, as stated, uh, and I'm going to, uh, at the appropriate time, not tonight, but uh, send in a concern to the policy committee to have re reviewed and that's the membership of the committee. I believe that the committee, when we deal with naming of schools, that committee should be made up of parents and educators across the system, not just within the local community or the two schools that are affected. So I will deal with that at the appropriate time. But having said that, um, E.A. Hutton uh, name, uh, he was a teacher, he was a principal, he was a superintendent, and he was a director of this board, an outstanding individual. And again, as stated uh, last week, I believe that the trustees and community groups should be considering educators uh, that have contributed to this board uh, over the years. So again, speaking against the motion through the chair. It's just a misprint I forgot to mention when I presented the lengthy report. Um, when you do look at the uh, division of votes at the bottom of 11A2, it is correct. Um, the opposed section should have read uh, Trustee Hicks, Brennan, Simmons, and White, um, not simply the reverse of the first division of votes. Thank you.
Trustee Orban then. <clears throat> I'm not going to disagree at all with my colleague, Trustee Hicks. We had that debate last week. But I would like to, because you, the chair, you gave permission, trustee, to give rationale, I'd like to support the ration, uh, rationalism as well. And that's with reviewing the policy. I think it's very important to review policy. And I'm not supporting the rationale behind it, but the, the notion of going and reviewing it. Because this year, we have uh, trustees that presenting naming. Uh, they use a different choice. In my opinion, we have to deal with the policy in order to rectify. And I appreciate the comment, that, uh, Trustee so uh, Orban, and I was making noise with my ice cubes <laughs> and my apologies to you personally. Uh, but um, that is not the motion that we're discussing. We're discussing um, the name of the secondary school. Out, uh, trustee, to give I take precedent with that and say, out it to one trustee, you'll allow it to another. So what I'm really saying is, in that that we should review policy. I do agree with Ali, but I do not agree with all the rationale that he presents. Thank so you. I just want to thank you for that. To add to that, Trustee Simmons. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'll continue to not s support this name, um, with the hopes that um, if it is turned down, that uh, uh, the work will go back to the naming committee, and uh, that they can find maybe somebody less. Uh, controversial. Um, I did support the EA Hutton name, but there's also, if we're, you know, there's a lot of merit in having a, a name of a, of a, uh, an educator, uh, a woman. Uh, we've had many of these at our board and um, somebody that uh, um, maybe doesn't have quite the, the same history. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Trustee White to the motion in item seven. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm voting against the motion and, and not um, because I oppose the name that was put forward. Um, but when I did read the selection of names, I was actually hoping that it would be referred back to the naming committee because I thought we could uh, have picked a more exciting and locally energizing choice, perhaps. Uh, we do have a number of strong educators here. Um, in the city of Hamilton. I was hoping we would choose one in particular. I know uh, the ad hoc approach of throwing a name out in a, in a, in a meeting um, is difficult because it's hard to make a case for someone historically without the entire background. But that being said, if we were to go back to the naming committee and hear further names, uh, we would be able to draw out further rationale and perhaps uh, have a different decision. So I'm not opposed to the current name, but I, I did think that uh, from an educational lens, we could have uh, uh, picked a stronger name that would have uh, promoted education here that is local. That any other commentary? Uh, any other first speakers? Uh, Trustee Orban, as, as briefly, I, please. As, as I think of rules, what we're really voting on, pro or con, the actual name that was, yeah. we want not to start new motions. And new Thank you. So the motion will not be accepted by my esteemed colleague, um, Tim Stern. Okay, just, yes, uh, Trustee Bishop. Um, I happened to read last week that uh, uh, 
other schools were are in a, a, across the province were being looked at for new names. And you'll remember we were brought three names, Martin Luther King, um, we were brought Chris, Chris Hatfield, and we were brought Nora Francis Henderson. Sorry, Trustee Bishop, it was Mandela. Nelson Mandela. I'm sorry, what did I say? Oh, Martin Luther King. I'm so sorry. I was so Equally scared. important. Nelson Mandela. And so, I, you know, what this name, Nora Frances Henderson, is, is a very Hamilton name. It's, uh, and I note, so we, we will be, this person gave a lot of service to the community and was a first in several ways. We don't have enough schools named after women. And I believe that this, this, the committee was doing its job in presenting a name to us for, for submission. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so to the motion, uh, which is a, a sub part of the report, mover being Trustee White, seconder being Karen Turkstra, um, that the standing committee recommends the new South Secondary School be named Nor Francis Henderson Secondary School to all those in favor of that motion. Um, that is Petal, Turkstra, Glauser, Orban, Maholland, Bishop, Johnstone, Student Trustee Van Egdom, Student Trustee Suzek. Those opposed are Simmons, Brennan, White, and Hicks. The uh, motion passes. Thank you. We now move to um, item 9A, and the person who asked for this to be separated um, was um, Trustee Turkstra. Yes, if you could. Uh... Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just um, again, you know, going to be voting um, favor of of this uh, motion uh, written by. And not because I, I'm not supporting the program strategy, but because I think that we're moving too quickly. Oh, all of the supports were mentioned to us on what's going to be in place for the grade eight. Um, I still think that um, still don't think we're ready personally and I'm not going to bring up what happened this week but you know there are some, some one more year of a proper transition proper transition alignment and lots of professional development with the some of our outlying schools have been good at this for a long time. They've kept their students and they have a practical experience with them. Uh, I feel like we're just moving too quickly. So I fully support the... Well, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, again, uh, this is an item that is moved by Trustee White. Trustee Turkstra, please be reminded that we are looking at the original motion and re-voting on the original motion. Just want to be clear on that. Um, uh, any other speakers to it? Uh, Trustee Simmons, Trustee Maholland, Trustee Orban. Yes, Trustee Simmons. Thank you. Um, I'm still uh, opposed to this motion. Uh, you know, we have to let our, our program strategy unfold. Um, right now we have uh, caring adults, we have individuals um, paying attention to each of these kids indiv as individuals uh, with their families and there's a lot of oversight with that. Imagine the grade eights going into Mountain now and then in their gr grade 12 year Happen to be split up to their home school for, uh, for their for their final year for their graduation. I don't think that would be a good transition for kids. I know that um, they'll get caring adults where they land, and uh, and 
our, our board has been working on this strategy quite successfully in many schools over the last three years. And uh, so I have uh, full expectation, and I know that this board will uh, make sure uh, staff will keep keep apprised of what staff is doing and the outcome for these kids. I know the, I believe the director when he says that each of these kids will be, on, he'll have their names on his desk and he'll be checking monthly for uh, um, how they're making out, how they're doing and what needs to be done if there are any changes. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, Trustee Mulholland. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Yeah, I, I don't usually make too many motions around here. I sit around, I listen. But you know, I feel very strongly on this one. By moving this motion, what it does, it really supports the inclusion. It lends support to what's happening because it is too fast. There's too many things that will not be ready for this school year coming. The also ready program, the training of the staff, the, the Tracking individuals, uh, something happened this week with, won't mention it, but the thing is that that demonstrates that we are not ready. All this does, it, it does it, it does support the inclusion, it does support the transition. I've been told in meetings, it doesn't do anything to take that off the rail. Rails, what it does, it just gives that grade eight to one year to move in there so that they can continue on with their education because they're not going to get the support. I, I'm sorry, but you could track it every month or something, but there will be many of those 87 grade eights not going to school, dropping out, causing problems when they're at school because there will not be the support. Don't care what you say. You just cannot support all those needs that are needed by those by those students. So that's, that's the reason I brought it. It had nothing to do with sculling the, the process or saying I don't favor tier one, two, three inclusion. I think that will work out in the future. But you got to give every student, the high ones and the, those with the special needs, you got to give them a fighting chance. We're not doing it for those 87 grade A's. I don't, I'm speaking, trustee Bishop. And I'm just saying that if you don't do this, there will be problems within the, the whole because you have to take lines off individual classes to make sure that you can accommodate. So you may have a one side of the scale, you may have 30, 31, 32, because you might have to crowd those classes so that you can have two or three for a reading or a math program. It, so I'm just saying, it's, it's a great it's a great program. I don't I don't like closing Parkview. When I started, we had seven vocational schools. We're down to one now, and that's going to disappear. And that's a mistake in this community. Tra tragic. So that we are going to eliminate vocational schools as we know them in this community, and especially what I represent. I'm not speaking too much about Ancaster, Waterdown, Stony Creek. I'm talking about the East End of this city. That's where all the need is. That's where these kids have come from. So uh, I will be supporting, uh, supporting. Yes, you you will I, be I will supporting support, the motion. I will support no. the motion. Yeah, the original motion. Thank, Thank you. Um, Trustee Orban. Oh, can I ask a question? We go yes. Uh, yeah. I, I'm a little confused there maybe because I, I've never seen a lost motion in the report, it's always at the bottom of the report where we have to move it up into the body of the report. Is this a change? Yes, it is a change. Rules? I checked with the, the officer rules? of trustee services and this is a change. change? When do we change? It would have been last year, but this oh, okay. is the first opportunity we would have seen one okay, like this. So we changed it. Yeah. I apologize. Thank so you. we, no, it's okay. I, I needed, thank you, trustee Mulholland. And maybe that's something to, thank you for that uh, point. That might be something to consider. Uh, the, basic, the basic issue here though is please be reminded you are talking to the original motion from last week. Thank you. So that means uh, Trustee Mulholland, you're in favor of your original motion. 
Thank you. Trustee Orban. I too, Madam Chair, am in favor of my colleague's motion. First of all, let's not forget the history of the vocational school student. I was a teacher at that time. And the validation of the program is the years it has been yeah, involved. You're still on the list. That's it. All these years, we were, very, we were reverent about it. We respected it, gave resources, etc. I agree with my colleagues, uh, not my colleagues, I leave with Trustee Turkstraw. All we're saying is give it another year or don't even uh, bother building the school and let them graduate, you know, uh, with their own community. Don't be in a hurry to put them in other areas because we could have done this years ago, mm -hmm. but we did. Should've. Why didn't we do it? I don't know. Because the, t the principal and teachers were doing an excellent job with these students. As a matter of fact, let's not forget some of these students actually went back to the regular high school, secondary school programs. <coughs> and, and because their needs were met and they did well as special ed students or other needy students. So I've seen that done. And I've seen those kids actually graduate when they went back to the regular high schools and go to university. You know, uh, th that has something to say for the programs that were there to meet the needs of these wonderful, darling kids. So what am I saying? What am I saying is I, I respect the director who's worked with his program strategies. And of course, what we did was, well, we're not sure about that because now we have a program committee. So. We, if we were sure about the strategies, we would have let it uh, work itself for the next couple of years. But we said, no, we need a program committee. Well, Madam Chair, also there's a need to respect this community of students. And the validation is in the results that came out of that, the indicators, et cetera, et cetera. So in my opinion, all we're saying is, what's wrong with a year? Or the, maybe we should think about how we transition needy students. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Trustee Orban. I have on the list uh, Trustee Johnstone, then I have Trustee White, and then I have Trustee Hicks. So you would be first, Trustee Johnstone. Thank you, Chair Brennan. Um, so speaking against the, the motion, because I don't see the crisis that, that some of the other trustees see. In fact, I am very confident in our staff. This past week at our Special Education Advisory Committee, um, I actually had the opportunity to meet Deb Dukes, who has been facilitating our transition process. And I have to say that not only did I feel that it was extremely comprehensive, extremely thought out, um, every little item was considered, but that wasn't just my opinion. That was the opinion of everyone around the table, which comprised of parents, representatives, as well as community stakeholders and community organizations that are very concerned with students with special um, education needs. So from that, we, the Special Education Advisory Committee actually gave a round of applause to Deb Dukes for the work that she's been doing. We feel that, uh, that, um, we, that the transition has been going smoothly and that we're well prepared. Most important uh, that came out of Deb's uh, report was, uh, was the connection of the caring adult. So every single student, when they go into their new school, their home school, they are matched with a caring adult, someone who's going to be checking in with them, um, especially during the first month, uh, month or two on a weekly basis to make sure that, um, that they're doing okay, asking them if they have any problems, um, or more often if needed, they will be checking in. So I'm, I am quite confident. I'm also happy that um, uh, East End schools were brought up because what comes to mind is Orchard Park. 
And on Special Education Advisory Committee, we have presentations from Orchard Park every single year on the great work that they're doing in special education. So I think that if we were to look to examples across the city and uh, Ancaster, certainly we have uh, some wonderful uh, special ed um, you know, programming going on there, but in the East End as well, and looking at uh, Orchard Park and the wonderful work that they're doing there, I don't think that we should be labeling communities that way. Thank you. Thank you. I have Trustee White and then Trustee Hicks. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just, when I look at the motion, I, I, I tend to reflect back to where we were in the ARC process and what some of the original decisions we made. When, when we think back, the intention for the Parkview community was, in fact, to continue to accept grade 8 students until, obviously, the new high school was built. So there was every intention to continue to have students flow into grade nine, et cetera, until the new school opens. Um, had this issue been put forward when we were scrambling to uh, figure out a transition plan for Parkview students, I think I would have entertained this, entertained this very, very seriously. Um, and quite frankly, I still might. But I think it hinges, though, on the feasibility of whether we could allow grade nines to get into Mountain. So I'll give an example, and I, I do have two questions, Madam Chair. Um, but the example I would use is that we know for a period of time that almost no students from Parkview wanted or were choosing Mountain to attend. In fact, the majority were wanting to go to Delta. And then through one-on-one -on -one with staff, eventually that turned into 80% plus who were willing to take transportation that we would provide and attend Mountain. Um, my concern is now we're dealing with a body of students in grade eight. The Parkview profile and the Parkview student is clustered, as Trustee Mulholland said, around East Hamilton in the center. So if that's the case, what is our feeling in terms of attracting a grade nine base from that area, given transportation, and actually get them up to the mountain? and incorporate them into that school. And the second part of my question is, what does our attendance at Mountain look like? Do we have Mountain students that have indicated they want to attend Mountain, or are they attending their home school? Because what I would hate to see is us send grade nine students to Mountain, and it turns out not enough go for us to provide effective programming, whereas if they attended their home school, we're in a better position. So my question to staff, Madam Chair, are two questions. Number one, we have any type of record or number of students that have indicated they would be willing to go to Mountain as a secondary school into grade nine? And secondly, how many students from the Mountain catchment have indicated they want to go to Mountain versus their home school? If I could uh, ask the director those two questions then. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, Executive Superintendent Reinhold is the one who has all of that information. Thank you very much. Through you, Madam Chair, um, we have uh, the numbers now, and the, I would say that most of the option sheets are in at the moment. Uh, there are just a few, and there are very specific, uh, either medical or health or family reasons why those had not com been completed. So right now, um, it would appear that we have, uh, from Mountain, we're going to have Sorry, it just flipped out on me. Give me one second. So we are expecting, um, right now we have 175 students who are registered at um, Mountain School. In second semester, we had um, approximately 80 students at the beginning of second semester from Mountain go to their home schools by their own choice because they could have stayed on through, but uh, they chose to go to their home school. And we have been following those students and they've been doing well since they have been gone to those schools this semester, although it's still early in the semester, about halfway. And uh, they have about 70, actually they're down a little bit because we've had a few more changeover. There are around 65 to 70 students who will be at Mountain next year and about 140, 130 from Parkview. So we're hovering right now between 175 and 190 with a few of those who are still hesitating about which way they want to go. That will be the total enrollment at Mountain for next year for grades 10, 11, and 12. Currently at one. 
75. Yes, uh, Trustee White. So, so that gives us a bit of a snapshot on where the current grade nines are going. So it seems to be up off from people, act, from students actually leaving Mountain. It sounds like over half of the grade nine population at Mountain actually leave Mountain after this year and go to their home school. Obviously, so, I mean, that seems significant to me. So once again, it goes back to the question, obviously we don't have a crystal ball, but if we were to offer a grade nine at Mountain as a choice to our lower city, how confident are we that we would have the numbers to actually create a grade nine class if we're not even attracting Mountain students to Mountain? Are we gonna attract lower city students to Mountain. So that, that's my main concern is that we set this up for failure and we can't actually implement and pull off a grade nine at Mountain. We don't have enough students. So that's just speculation because we don't have the crystal ball. We can't say we will have X number of students. My gut feeling says we're not. Um, but I'll ask the question maybe through to you, Madam Chair, to staff. Is there a critical number in order to provide quality, whether it's vocational, special education programming for a grade nine body like that? Because if we end up with, if we're looking at 175 now, let's just say that gets cut in half. I mean, we can only assume, but let's say that turns into 100. Can we provide quality special edu education programming in a setting like that versus a home school? Yes, uh, Mr. Director. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, it's not that there's a fixed number uh, to provide effective programming. What happens, though, is that we do have collective agreement requirements regarding students who are studying at certain levels with certain needs. Class sizes change and become smaller. We're also dealing with the fact that at this point in time, as the executive superintendent suggested, our option sheet process is finished, and we are now in the stage of staffing and planning for students. So we don't know uh, students who are moving from grade eight to grade nine who have already engaged in transition work. Uh, we are placing, as the trustees know, a very specialized program at Delta and at the New South School housed at Barton. It won't be the same, but it is going to be there for students who need that. And so at this point, the 87 interviews with grade eight families have been finished. Their option sheets are in and they're being scheduled for at this time. So if the board makes a different decision, we would have to go back to those families to see if they wish to change then we'd have to deal with what impact it has on staffing in the regular schools that they are now signed up for. All of it, though, is, pre I can't know. I can't know until we ask. Uh, Trustee White, I have other people. Yep. Thank you. you know, just to finish off my remaining second, seconds, maybe plural, second. Um, just my final comment is, is it just really concerns me that if we don't have the proper numbers in grade nine at Mountain, we're not gonna be able to pull off quality programming. We've put Parkview students through a tug of war where you're going here, then you're going here, and you're going here. It's hard to keep track of where the current plan is. So we have potential of opening up a grade nine class, class at Mountain, and then perhaps having a situation where we've just had half of our Mountain class pull out after this year. What's that gonna look like next year if we don't pull this off correctly? We This could turn out to be a further disaster and then we're trying to incorporate a further transition. So I just worry that another transition, another change of plans is actually going to cause more confusion and more disruption for this class to be successful. Thank you and I have Trustee Hicks. Thank you uh, Trustee Hicks for your patience. Thank you. Through the chair, uh, I respect Trustee Mulholland's passion and uh, I understand where he's coming from. But this issue for me is a trust issue. I thought about it a lot since the standing committee and the discussion that we had at the standing committee. And all of the questions that were asked, to me, the officials answered those questions. And I firmly believe that the officials are ready to, to implement it properly. Trust them at this time. It's extremely important that when issues come up, trustees vote on issues where they feel comfortable and I feel comfortable with this issue because I trust the officials that this, these issues that other trustees have talked about have been, they are being worked on now and it'll be fine tuned by the time we get to September. Thank you through the chair. Thank you very much. Um, to the original motion, um, we moved by uh, Trustee White and uh, Trustee Turkstra. All those in favor? Uh, Petal? Turkstra? 
Orban and Mulholland. Thank you. All those against? Glauser, Hicks, White, Brennan, Bishop, Johnstone, Student uh, Trustee Van Egdom, Student Trustee Suzik, Trustee Simmons. Um, the motion is defeated. Thank you. Thank you all very much. And we move then to the Student Trustees Report. Uh, looking to our uh, student trustees, Carly, Van Egdom, and uh, Philip Suzik. So, I'm sorry, I, 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 I so much an, anticipated your report that I've jumped over another item. So my apologies for that. All is uh, well. <laughs> uh, so this is the, um, if I could uh, t turn to the vice chair and ask for the report from the uh, public report from the private session of Committee of the Whole. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure to present the report of the private session of Committee of the Whole held earlier this evening. The committee considered a private report from the Standing Committee March 24th, 2014, including approval of a private matter in respect to an employee of the board, approval of the Finance Committee report for March 5th, 2014, in respect to an update about an upcoming announcement from the Ministry of Education with respect to capital funding, and lastly, an approval of the Human Resource report from February 12th, 2014, with updates on personnel matters. And Madam Chair, I'm happy to move the report. Thank you very much. To, is there a seconder? Trustee Glauser? All those in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you very much. Now we go to the student trustee report. Thank you very much. So Carly clearly threw me under the bus, so I'll start off with this report. Um, I will be doing the student trustees report with regard to AUSTA ACO, the Ontario Student Trustees Association. First and foremost, we're pleased to announce that AGM, or our annual general meeting, will be taking place on May 8th to 11th. That will involve all current student trustees and all incoming student trustees as well. Secondly, Carly has been working vigorously on the Student Voice Awards, which is a scholarship offered by Student Ontario, or sorry, by Ontario Student Trustees Association. As for myself, I've been doing work with the Policy Committee, which involves generic work, just cleaning up the Constitution. Aside from that, all has been slow on the Asta Eco front, aside from, furthermore, uh, the fact that we've been working on a new system which involves all student trustees reporting to their regional reps. Essentially, this is just done, it's a amendment that was added to our constitution uh, which allows student trustees to report to their regional reps so that uh, the promotion of transparency takes place between all st student trustees. And that's all that's taking place on Austin Eco front. Uh, so I'll be doing our local activities report and uh, both Philip and I are really excited to announce that we've named our conference the Sway Conference, so uh, Student well Wellness Among Youth. And we're really, really excited about this conference. Uh, we'll be running it with the Senate. And it's going to be a one-day conference held at St. Joseph's New West Fifth um, facility in the mental health faci facility there. Um, so we've been working really hard to set a date. Um, we're not quite there yet for choosing a date, but um, we'll definitely have one soon. And we're also uh, starting to work on our workshops. All workshops will be student senator led. And um, we'll have some physical and mental well-being workshops, as well as self-awareness and healthy eating components, which will be in our workshop. So really excited to just announce that we're going to be working on um, wellness within the students of this board. And um, yeah, it's just really exciting. I, I can't wait to go. And yeah. Could you remind me of the date for that uh, conference? Uh, we haven't officially chosen a date, but we're, we're in conversation with the um, facility right now. I'm just trying to choose one, but we're thinking around um, the 12th to the 16th of May. Um, also, another uh, another item is uh, we're working on student trustee elections, so we're hoping to do elections. Um, I think it. What is it? May 7th. So that's the date that we'll be doing um, elections, and then the student trustees that are elected will be coming with us on uh, our conference. So directly after they're elected, they'll be coming with us that weekend, so 
Yes, very freshly minted student trustees ready for the conference. Yeah, Thank you sure. very much. So under the chair's report, I just uh, want to thank the community as a whole, uh, the individual parents and students uh, who are um, experiencing the transitions now and are giving us advice on how it's maybe working or maybe not working and how we could in fact do things better. Um, also want to uh, thank the staff for the tremendous amount of work they have to do to bring information forward to the students and the communities and the st uh, other staff at the local schools in terms of transitions. And I uh, know that this is challenging work, uh, but I'm very appreciative of everyone's efforts to work through our current transitions that are based on previous decisions about two years ago. Um, you will all know, of course, the next couple of months are more decisions to be made um, and we already have had very hardworking people in East Hamilton and West Flamborough and various other points, ports of call across uh, this uh, district to in fact think about ideas and then to present those ideas to us. So to the committee people who were on those um, ARC uh, committees, to the uh, parents who were there, to the student representatives, to all the individual staff who had to work on all of those um, arcs. I am extremely grateful for uh, the work that you've done and the advice that you've given us. It now is up to us as a board of trustees to read all that, to think about all that, uh, to listen to people, to receive more correspondence as we know we will get, we will have delegation nights uh, coming uh, up for us to really be listening to what people um, are recommending to us. And it, there's a lot of work for us as uh, trustees as well. I know that as trustees, we also have other questions. And I know staff will be working through the director to be sure that that information comes to us. So there's so much uh, information and thoughtfulness and listening and consideration and conversation that still ne needs to happen. So I do want everyone uh, to um, be ready, but at the same time to recognize the tremendous amount of work that has come before we even get to look at those reports. Uh, as you may remember, uh, we thought the transitional period might be uh, um, enough work uh, to keep our staff busy and our schools, communities busy, that we um, decided in December not to have uh, the ones originally scheduled for this coming year in September uh, 14 to June 15. So, um, yeah. It, it brings me to speaking about the City Council's motion on moratorium on school count, uh, closures. Um, they have requested, as you may know from a meeting of a few weeks ago, that the province consider um, actually a moratorium on school closures. Uh, certainly, given the work that uh, our communities have done in giving, bringing us the material that they're bringing to us at this point, um, it is respectful for us to continue with the process and I understand that there is no will on the uh, uh, municipal government's part to in fact put any moratorium. We ourselves have done a delay um, and we understand the impact. But um, we've received, we understand that the um, council itself has given some referral of items to the C city board committee. Um, I've also been approached uh, and, uh, by um, Councillor McHattie, who is a member of the city board relations committee, um, outlining some of his concerns and the concerns of council and um, uh, encouraging us to in fact call a city board relations committee. I uh, appreciated uh, his, his list of concerns. I certainly myself uh, as chair of this board uh, have some things that I believe we must talk to the city uh, representatives, um, we must talk to them about. Uh, so I have contacted the mayor's office and the um, staff 
uh, between the city and the board. The various staffs are now looking at setting up a meeting, a location, a date, and a time. I certainly will be looking to Todd as the vice chair and a member of that committee, um, our representative and myself, and Trustee Hicks, who has been on that committee for some years, uh, to give us um, uh, put together what are the things we want to say to the city councillors and th through um, this committee. Also be looking for uh, very specific uh, uh, advice from uh, former chairs, uh, trustee uh, Tim Simmons and Judith Bishop in terms of the relationship of that uh, committee over the last number of years. And then I'm uh, clearly going to be asking everyone else what it is we need to be saying uh, as trustees, what it is that we need to be saying to our councillors about the, our realities and our responsibilities and um, what we need to do to move forward together as city council and as uh, a board. So um, in terms of my remarks, I just wanted to be sure that uh, we are listening to the community. We are hearing from the public that why, why aren't you two talking to each other? And we are moving towards doing exactly that and making sure that we as a board of trustees very strongly present what our realities and look for some solutions or suggestions from everybody who has them for us. Thank you. I, I did want to point out the trustee pedal um, has left. Thank you for giving me the words. Um, I move then to the uh, director's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of items since uh, we met last that I wanted to, to bring forward to the trustees' uh, attention. The transition work that you uh, commented on is continuing in full force on a number of different levels. One of the things that I've asked Executive Superint Superintendent Reinhold to uh, publish uh, through the update is what is happening immediately in terms of the transitions that are taking place right now and then what the next level of transition is for 2015 and the third level of transition 2016. And the reason why I'm mentioning that is because what we're finding is that by focusing on those transitions that are urgently in front of us and not forgetting about other transitions but ensuring that we have the appropriate staff working for September 2014 now then of course moving that to those other challenges and wonderful opportunities that are coming in the next year. That's something I wanted to mention because I know many of you have asked me when we're going to start having meetings say with communities whose changes are not going to happen until a year from September. That will hopefully begin right away after we are in place with the transitions we've discussed. So that was one point I wanted to mention. The other exciting piece I wanted to mention in light of the passing of the vision around 21st century learning. One of the things that we've learned is that the use of the term 21st century learning, and it was the students who taught me this, actually doesn't make sense when we're already in the 21st century. So even though we're trying to be very visionary in our approach, and frankly, I would suggest that the motion that you made this evening to pass that is one of the first of its kind in the province and beyond, we are, we've been working with our students, we've been working with our staff, not to keep calling it 21st century learning, but rather to call it transforming learning everywhere, because this is about instruction, this is about transformation, this is about kids learning in ways different than we normally speak about. So you're going to be hearing much more about this as we go forward. We are continuing with learning sessions in the schools that are doing this work first. We are learning great insight from them and we're continuing to move forward. Another exciting emerging um, example of this new way of thinking is that we invited secondary schools to consider sending a team to a session just a little while ago, and we asked them to think differently about credit delivery. In other words, what would it be like if students started with questions and the curriculum wrapped around those questions, and like we did 20 years ago when we created co-op and never, no one understood how to make it happen back then, that we actually create uh, a credit delivery process that's much more problem-based, interest-based, and not so formal or traditional in terms of how uh, credits are offered. So the invitation went out and right now small teams are happening at, at different schools exploring this. We're not 
asking everybody to do it right away. We're simply asking for this exploration to happen. And about 10 teams of teachers are presently engaging in that, which is quite exciting. Our math learning sessions and our positive school climate sessions are continuing. And our goal is that all of the things that we're trying to focus our learning on are directly from our strategic directions and those commitments that have been made through the annual operating plan. So as much as we're doing transition work, we're also doing significant change work in terms of the kind of learning environments that we've discussed. And we're quite excited about moving forward, especially changing our learning environments and transforming that learning in every single classroom. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then to um, Christy Johnstone, our director to the Ontario Public School Boards Association for your report then. Thank you, Chair Brennan. Um, so I have a couple items to cover tonight. First um, is uh, I would hope most trustees are aware is there was a direct message sent to, to all individual trustees that amendments have been made to the Ontario Regulation 357-06 and that was to extend the restraint period for trustees honorarium to November 30th, 2014. Um, you'll recall that uh, the current restraint period was originally posed um, in 2010 uh, and uh, was to last until uh, 2012 and it was subsequently extended. It was supposed to end today, uh, but it has been extended. Uh, it was extended last week to, to uh, November 30th. Uh, my next item is Integrated Service Delivery Symposium, which is taking place on May 1st, 2014. Um, only members of the OPSPA policy and um, uh, program committee members were invited. And uh, Judith Bishop will be attending along with Superintendent Manny Figueredo. Um, and they will be looking at uh, policy and funding changes to support schools as community hubs initiative. Um, another item which you all would have received in your mailboxes on Friday was uh, OPSPA released a letter to the federal government on Bill C-23, which was the Fair Elections Act. And OPSPA is asking our boards to send letters to our M uh, MPs. And we're also, uh, I'm also wondering if we could get um, a motion to endorse um, endorse the letter tonight. Trustees will recall that um, uh, in the letter from OPSBA were concerned about the bill, including the limiting of the powers of the, electoral, of the chief electoral officer, the loss of informational and educational programs and the use of media or other means for the purposes of educating the public on the importance of voting and democracy, as well as eliminating an important and necessary method used for voter identification. OSPA uh, went on to, rate, um, to say that uh, is school board trustees, um, these issues are of concern to us because we are interested in raising the profile of democratically locally elected school board trustees and we're also um, interested in uh, increasing our our connection to uh, the local decision making and we're also interested in increasing participation in the democratic process at all levels of government. So I'm hoping um, if I could make a motion to, to endorse the letter on uh, the Fair Elections Act and if I could get a seconder. I believe I'm the one who calls for the seconder. Thank okay. you, Trustee Johnstone. Uh, this is to endorse the letter uh, from OBSPA. Mm -hmm. it, it's coming out of her, it, it's coming through her report. It's part of her report. Motions can come from okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so what is your motion, Trustee Johnstone, on your report, from your report? Yes, to endorse the OPSPA letter to the federal government on Bill C-23, Fair Elections Act. You would have got received, everyone received a copy in their email from OPSPA directly. Do I have a seconder for that? Good. Uh, Trustee Johnstone, you've spoken to the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, Trustee Bishop? 
Madam Chairman, the, the um, letter that has been written on our behalf by the Ontario Public School Boards Association is an excellent letter in, in which I'm, I'm sure most of us have read. Um, the, the letter I I indicates that what an important role uh, education about democracy is. As you know, that's part of our curriculum, but it's also we support things like Student Vote, which is a, 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 an, an organization to get students out to do a mock vote for, uh, at elections for both federal and provincial and also municipal votes, the, the, um, systems. Um, so, Madam Chairman, um, the, the proposed changes which, which would take away the education role and the support for such, such organizations, such as Student Vote, which would also limit the powers of the election officer, <laughs> seem to me directly opposed to some of the things which most of us believe very strongly in and what is an important part of our role as trustees, which is to promote, which is really linked to the work of Edgerson Ryerson, who saw education as being the way in which you, you promoted citizens and that you could, you could not have adequate citizens of a country without education and that education and the role of democracy was in, in, intrinsically related together in the teachings of our schools. So thank you, Madam Chairman, I'll be supporting this. Uh, Trustee Simmons, then Trustee Glauser. Thank you. I, I will be supporting the motion, but the irony here hasn't escaped me. Uh, we're in public, and a motion has been brought forward out of a report that the public didn't receive um, the letter. And not everybody maybe read their email on this case or there wasn't a notification that this was coming and you need to look at it because there's a motion coming. And I think this is a slippery slope here in our process. Okay. Um, and uh, so if you would note that, I'm, I, the intent of the motion I strongly support, but the way we're going about this makes, doesn't make me comfortable. Thank you. Yes, uh, Trustee Glauser. Actually, I was going to say fairly similar. Normally, we might at least get a lead in that there's going to be a motion tonight, and those that haven't read their letter would certainly have done it. I guess the question through the chair would be that is there a time sensitivity, or would this hurt coming back at a next meeting? Yes, Trustee Johnstone. There's, we could certainly table the item until our next meeting if trustees would feel better about that. Not table, but... Um, Sorry, there are some process questions. I'm asking the Officer of Trustee Services, and uh, um, I just need to be clear. <coughs> I will withdraw at this time and bring it back at our next meeting. Thank you very much. I do have, um, I guess, two more items. Um, so my next item is on uh, just to bring trustees awareness to the GSN announcement that was made on Thursday. So if you haven't been checking your emails, please do, because there's been lots of important information coming through recently. Um, I'll leave the updates to uh, finance, but just to note that uh, OPSPA did release a letter as well on Thursday, um, commenting that uh, they are in support of the GSN announcement, and uh, it does reflect our brief to um, to the Ministry of Education as, uh, as done through the Efficiencies and Modernization Consultation. Um, and then I also have a legislative update. Um, so there's only a few items. Bill 179 uh, was introduced, and that was uh, the Public Sector and MPP Accountability and Transparency Act. Uh, you'll recall that this was um, uh, what uh, Trustee White's motion was to, uh, which we, uh, this board supported, uh, which was to have Ontario Ombudsman's role to expand and increase and to include municipalities, school boards, and public public universities. Uh, Bill 69, the Prompt Payment Act, is uh, continuing right now at Standing Committee, uh, and that affects school boards. I've ch chatted about this previously in regards to contracts and subcontracts, and OPSPA had uh, requested that school boards be excluded from that act, uh, so that's currently being debated at the Standing Committee. Bill. Um, 
122 continues to be re uh, reviewed by standing committee. And there's also been a number of um, cabinet shuffles, um, but none of them affect the Ministry of Education. <laughs> if you're curious, you can go online and uh, OPSPA has a full report there as well. Thank you for that. As you remember uh, from our last um, meeting and uh, in terms of moving forward in terms of process, um, we will be setting aside as we are tonight time for trustees to ask questions related to any of the ARCs. Uh, as you remember from the process, um, uh, if you ask questions tonight, they will not be provided uh, answers tonight because as we agreed, we would work towards having it publicly answered for all trustees uh, the following when, uh, Monday. If you have, however, um, uh, questions that come in the Wednesday before any meeting, then um, it is an expectation that the staff would be able to provide uh, um, answers to those questions on the Monday night. So I hope that's clear. I'll take any question just on that process. Just in terms of moving forward, this follows very much what we did before. There's just a little bit more of a tweak in terms of being sure that if you want the questions answered a certain time, that it'd be best if they came to you, came to our trustee officer on the Wednesday before the meeting. So we do have some, I know, I am aware that we have some questions that trustees will want to ask tonight. Uh, we did also receive some questions from Wednesday, and I wonder if we could leave the Wednesday ones until we've just gotten all the other questions at least, because uh, I don't know who in this room is going to be asking questions first. Okay, um, so trustees with questions for the ARCs? Yes, let's go uh, Trustee Bishop. Oh, my questions are rather general ones. My first question is about how many schools will there be coming out of these, the staff ARC proposals that will be less, that will be JK to eight schools, less than 600 pupils? Okay, thank you. And my second question is, um, uh, uh, have we looked at, uh, when we're looking at boundary changes, have we taken into account that we, we have mixed socioeconomic areas when included in those boundary changes. Have we taken, has that been a, a, an issue that we have looked at? Thank you. Okay, any, any other questions from any other trustee? Uh, trustee Turkstra. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have a lot of questions that I think I have already circulated to staff and copied to going to read them for the public record? Yes, thank you. So um, indulge me, if you don't mind, I have about 25 questions. Could we take them in lots? Yes. <laughs> uh, like 12 and 13? I will start with West Flamborough, given that that was the arc yes. that I was in. Or how about let's break them up by arc? Sounds good. Okay. Start, I'll start with West Flamborough. Thank now. you very much. So my first question is, uh, for the recommended Beverly Community Center partnership potential with the City of Hamilton, uh, please commence your due diligence for the addition of a 350 school to this site, keeping in mind the floodplain and wooded lot areas. So the question is, is this site viable to accommodate a 350 Okay, thank you. On the ARC report, page 9-41, the buses are to remain at 24 for the accommodation area in question. How are the buses being distributed under the ARC and staff recommendations? What are the bus distances and lengths of time on the bus for the students, especially that the northern portion of both areas will be transferred primary students long? The ARC was very specific that staff look into rural transportation through an equity and compassion lens, especially when consolidating schools with very Staff look through these lenses when providing their responses. 
Why does staff support a rural school of 525 students? This is out of the norm for all of our other rural schools. What are the sizes of the other rural schools, including any staff recommendations of the ARCs underway? How many students by grade are currently coming down to school at Millville Public School who live north of Regional Road 97? What are their current bus distances and times to Millgrove Public School? And what would they be to Spencer Valley? The same question as the previous one for the children who attend Seton and Beverly Central, who would be attending a new school on the Beverly Are there any well water and septic implications recommended consolidations at Beverly Central and Spencer Valley School? They need expansions. What is involved? Oops, I've ripped my questions. <laughs> There's another copy. Uh oh, too bad. Oops. No. Uh, in the long term facilities master plan of 2013, Melgrove Public School was not slotted to participate in any upcoming accommodation reviews. Why and how can staff now recommend a closure on such short notice to the community? What are the renewal needs of public of Melgrove Public School in years one to five and six to ten compared to Mount Hope, a rural school, Spencer Valley, a rural school, Beverly Central, a rural school? Does staff see Millgrove Public School as having value given its proximity to Waterdown, a high growth area as a spillover school for overcapacity schools or an alternative to portables? Please provide a map of all of the Waterdown schools and their proximity to Millgrove Public School. Appendix C, uh, page 9-59, the capital uh, the required capital projects without ministry funding chart has full day kindergarten and classroom additions listed as an expense, but it doesn't show any FDK funding. Why? Uh, number 12 is what are the names and dates of the other rural schools that have closed in the past? Last one for Flamborough is in our criteria of value to the student, value to the school board, proximity to the school, length of bus ride, and value of the school if it is the only school within the community. How did staff decide to recommend leaving a school in Rockton and Greensville, but not in Millgrove? Sheffield, Linden, Freelton, Strabane, and others have already lost their community schools. Over the years. How do we value our rural schools into the future? Is that a question for staff or more of a, the, that last one? Is that a question for staff or more of a discussion point for the rest of us? Uh, that is for staff on how they are valuing rural schools from the community. Okay. I, I think I, you mean the, in their in, recommendation. In their recommendation. Okay. That's fine. That, we're just taking the questions. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, let's give you a little break. Um, do we have questions or who else? Who's next for questions? Yeah, Trustee Simmons. I think just the key when it comes to rural schools is, is the transportation, uh, especially for younger kids and uh, how that might be mitigated either with more buses or, or with schools. So that's your the, the question you want to be sure is on the list. Thank you. Trustee Orban, you have questions? Yes. We're expecting presentations from the community. I would like to hear uh, when comes in and gives them private areas. I may have a question that will be generated by those presentations. It's a little premature tonight. I mean, I have my own opinions, I read everything, and I do uh, appreciate um, the rural uh, school um, uh, almost as a special group. I and you're. Know, I'm sorry. Be, this is. This, I know, but 
we had a, a slew of questions right now. Yeah, but we're, that is what we're doing. I'm sorry. I, let, me, let me be more clear. I guess this I haven't been. This, this is an opportunity to be sure that in public, trustees have, an op, uh, have a chance to ask questions of staff so that next week we will get some of those answers. And we'll be doing this every week. Uh, yes, uh, I'm hearing commentary about we want to hear from the public and the delegation nights, and of course we do. And that'll probably generate some more questions. And then we'll say to staff, oh, what would that actually look like if that idea did take place? So this is part of the process that we did last time. Uh, I know for some people this is a bit challenging um, because maybe they do want to wait until the presentations and then ask questions, but other people have questions now, and so uh, we're allowing that opportunity at the end of every single meeting. So uh, that's how we're going to do that, and I appreciate people. Uh, and not everybody has read everything yet. Maybe people don't even have questions yet, I mean, as trustees yet. But we do it every week for the next two months. I have a feeling every single question that could ever be asked will be asked. Okay, anyone else with questions? If not, I'll go back to uh, Trustee Turkstra. Uh, the general question was that I was requesting to have the school information profiles from the binders from the ARCs, which includes the facility condition index because we haven't been provided any of those. Also the site sizes as they're not provided on the school information profiles. And also um, the heat maps, which are enrollment maps into the future, showing us where we have declining enrollment. I found those to be, and I think everyone did, very helpful when we were looking at um, when we were looking at uh, decision arcs. So SIPs, site sizes, and heat maps for all of them. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that some people. Uh, aren't asking as many questions as I am, but I find that the earlier we get them to staff, the better that we can be prepared to at least understand some of the perspectives of the uh, delegations when they come. But, uh, Trustee Turkstra, uh, and so let's go with another batch okay, of questions. Okay, so Wes Glenn. And then I have a feeling I have to move to Trustee White because he's feeling an annoyed and left out. Go ahead, Trustee Turkstra. So Wes Glanbrook, um, why was Balmore not included in the terms of reference given its overcapacity status and proximity to the accommodation area? And if they could provide a map of the area including all three schools. Uh, where do the students from Mount Hope currently feed to for secondary school? And to provide a map of the secondary schools surrounding the Mount Hope school? And how can an addition of one bus not add additional transportation funding? And the last one for West Glanbrook for now is, are there any well, water, and septic implications of consolidation to Mount Hope School? And if so, what's involved? Um, do we have any other questions from anyone else? Uh, now, um, Trustee White did submit some questions on Wednesday, so I was going to wait until the end for us to receive the answers. But do you have any other question now? Well, aside, from aside from those. Thank you. Am I, am I? You are allowed. Thank you for the permission. Uh, quick question, just on, on a similar note to uh, Trustee Turkstra. Um, I know there's situations in Flamborough and Glanbrook where there is a school that either, either has been brought in to the terms of reference and part of the review or not included and that, and that was a recommendation from staff and approved by trustees so I get the process but the question I have is mainly around the context of the Glanbrook piece because Mark and some some talk that Binbrook or sorry Belmore the new school should have been um, you know obviously why that wasn't included the intention last year but what I'm guessing is that the our committee may have wanted to play with the boundary. I just wanted to get a bit more background on what some of those feelings were and then some background because we do have a boundary review policy going through that may have further options there. So if we can get some 
thought on why only the two were recommended and approved, what could be done after the fact um, in terms of whatever that desire is. Okay. So we have an option. Thank you for that. Uh, back to um, Trustee Turkstra. And we are on which arc now? We'll go to the east. Let's go to the east mountain. Thank you. So I have six questions. Oh, I think it's Central Mountain, is it not? No. I have East Hamilton, sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. Did I say mountain? Yes, you did. It's okay. East Hamilton. Yeah, we're from the west. We're very geographically confused. Go ahead. So we're at East Hamilton. So the first question I had is why were there no parent representatives from Hillcrest on the ARC membership? And W.H. Ballard has an on-the-ground capacity of 840 students. I wanted to know the history of that size of school. Please provide a map including A.M. Cunningham and Queen Mary Schools, re page 10-15 about trustee consideration of a further boundary review with schools outside the accommodation area review. Uh, the busing estimates are not consistent. Please verify which is more correct. On page 10-20, the busing is estimated at $231,000 increase annually, which is an increase of 100 students becoming bus eligible. And on 10-41, the estimated cost is $109,000. On page 10-20, with approximately 2,000 students in the review area, an increase of 300 students, which is about becoming bus eligible, equates to efficiencies. How is a less walkable school community and more expensive transportation defined as efficient? How did the ARC react to a JK to 5 school merging with a JK to 8 school as the newcomers are often considered outsiders to an established student population? Are there any concerns and do the grade 8 students feed to the same? And that's East Hamilton. So I, oh yes, thank you very much. Uh, student trustee um, Van Egdom. I just have one question, and this relates to, well, most specifically the uh, Flamborough Arc, but it could be any rural arc. Uh, and my question is, what is the feasibility of an express bus uh, transferring students from the far-reaching edges of the boundary directly to the school rather than a winding long pickup route in order to reduce busing times? So that's my question. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, Trustee Turkstra, I think we'll finish. We're moving to the fourth one now. We'll finish with you, and then we'll go to uh, Trustee White. All Thank right. you. So, oh, and now we're going to Central Mountain. Now we're going to the Central Mountain. Thank we're you. We're traveling all around Central Hamilton Mountain. today. Yes, that's right. So the first question is, is the staff recommendation the same as any of the 35 options of the ARC? Second question is, similar to East Hamilton, how did the ARC react to JK to 6 schools? Comers are often outsiders to an established student population. Are there any concerns and do they? With thanks. Thank you. Uh, now, we have. Um, Questions you submitted, to Trustee White, and we have answers. Is that? I have any answers because I didn't bring my questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Questions. Okay. Thank you. So these are my questions that I submitted last uh, Wednesday or Tuesday. Um, I asked uh, four questions. Uh, they all pertain to East Hamilton. Uh, the committee itself uh, created a number of different scenarios. So I asked for two further scenarios that the committee uh, did not request uh, to add toward the record. So I asked for a scenario that closes Woodward and Rocks Park in June 2015, and the remainder of the schools will remain open. And I asked staff to consider boundary grade restructuring of the remaining schools to optimize people, places, and program delivery. Uh, second scenario I, I requested was uh, to close Woodward and Parkdale in June 2015. 
the remainder of the schools would remain open. Once again, ask staff to consider boundary grade restructuring of the remaining schools to optimize pupil places and programming. Um, also, similar to Trustee Turkstra, uh, somewhere in the East Hamilton Arc report, uh, Karen, page number, but there was a suggestion for a post-ARC boundary review. So I asked that if there is, a, the board approves the post-ARC boundary review, how many students would Viscount absorb if it's Western boundary extended to Kenilworth? Uh, please provide current and future projections. And lastly, if the board approves the post-ARC boundary review, how many students would Ballard absorb if it's Western boundary extended entirely to Kenilworth? Once again, provide current and future projections. You? Mr. Del Bianco. Okay, through you, Madam Chair, our first question. So please create a scenario which closes Woodward and Roxborough Park. Um, the information will be distributed in a handout tomorrow. But uh, just to review some of the highlights of this. Thank you uh, for that. So it, it'll be sent to the trustees? Correct. I just want to be sure people might be scribbling. Yeah, so don't, don't, don't scribble. We'll, we'll highlight it all for you. Just quickly under this scenario, I think some of the numbers that jump out is you're dealing with approximately 800 plus surplus pupil places still at the end of this. The average utilization rate per school under this scenario is approximately 68%. The challenge we have under these scenarios is by closing the two schools, the, there are so many packed in such a small review area that it you're really drawing the boundary lines, one street up, one street down. You don't have the flexibility to really enlarge boundaries because you keep so many schools open under uh, under this option. So let me just quickly. What? No, sorry. That was. This is the map of that scenario, which will be accompanying it. So you can see, um, highlighted to everybody. You can see that really you're closing the two, but everything else is so jam packed in here that drawing lines, all you're doing is really taking from one and stealing stealing enrollment from one at the expense of another. So it's, it's really tough to balance enrollments and keep everything at a healthy, vibrant level um, when you have so few schools in such a small geography that you're working with in. And the second scenario would include uh, the closure of Woodward and Parkdale. Um, again, the, the, what we run into here is actually a surplus of almost still 900 pupil places under this scenario and an average utilization rate at about 61% per school. The same challenges still apply um, in dealing, only taking two schools out of the, the mix, you still are stuck with a number of really, really small boundaries that regardless of how you move it over north, south, east or west, what you're really doing is adding to one school at the expense of another and at the end of the day you still have uh, in excess of 900 surplus pupil places. Um, the other challenge that we may run into if we go down a scenario such as this is any business case that we submit for the construction of a new school I think would be uh, a challenge to make uh, in that we have surplus pupil uh, spaces in this particular area. Just to ensure I've captured the geographies correctly, um, we were first asked to find out the number of students uh, uh, west and the western boundary. So the east of Kenilworth area, which is this geography here. So part of this is just to confirm I'm, I'm identifying the prop. Thank you. Thumbs up there. So as of October, um, there were, I can't see, that's, this is how bad I've gotten. I have to take my glasses off. 26 students. And then the second geography, thumbs up on that area. Okay, perfect. Yes, 39 students in that geography there. And I believe those were the four questions that we were asked to explore. Um, and this information, including the boundary maps, will be distributed and posted on the board website as well. After 12 meetings, the committee, our committee, come up with two options 
because they didn't want to put one because they were sort of majority wanted one, but there was some strong feelings too. Uh, the first one is, as you're aware of, closing Woodward, Parkdale, Roxborough Park, Rosedale, and building a new school at the Vine Count property. How does the staff feel about that? Comfortable or what? Now, these are questions that were, I, well, we, we know what the staff has recommended. Um, you know, they're human beings, and I do care about how they feel <laughs> as human beings, but really, how they feel about a, a recommendation, they've recommended it. That tells me everything I would think we need to know. Mr. Director, can you give me some direction? Yes, the staff recommended the our committee's first choice recommendation in the report we gave you recently. They close by asking, they all close at the same time, they all move in to new school when it's built. Because that's what they staff. Sorry, it, if that's a question that's being asked, maybe we don't have the answer right now. That's how we decided to handle tonight, is to just ask the questions. Hey, Madam Chair, if you want us to answer what our recommendation was, or if you want us to take it away, it's, it's your decision. So is the question what it was your recommendation? We could repeat our recommendation, or we can take the question away. It's your direction. I would say it's being asked tonight. Let's take it away for next week. Thank you. And I want to, I know, I know there is, uh, inside each question, there often is an implied position or argumentation. I really want us tonight, and, and as we do this, to be sure we're asking questions. And um, we'll, we have set aside much time for discussion and argumentation and decision making. So uh, let's continue with the answers to the questions that were asked by Trustee White. Thank you. So just a couple of follow up questions. Uh, well, again, uh, sorry, these just want to be, I want to be clear. Perfect. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Trustee White, go ahead, please. Thank you. So questions of clarification on these questions that I submitted yes. in advance. Thank you. Um, in terms of boundaries, as mentioned, when a boundary is cut, it's either taken from one school or another. Um, the logic in terms of the map, so when we look at, if you go, if perhaps Dan could go up a couple slides. Um, I'm just wondering why um, staff chose those particular boundaries, because in my question, I left it very open-ended because I didn't want to suggest particular boundaries, but I'm just wondering why, for instance, you know, Rock Park, when, when say in that map there, Parkdale closes, they all go to Ballard versus balancing somewhere between Rocks Park and Ballard. I'm just wondering why the kind of extreme was, was chosen in some of the cases. If, if we're getting again into why, and, and I think um, uh, direct, we, uh, we may need the director to uh, speak to the staff about whether that's even appropriate for them to answer. I, I, again, I want to go back to the point we're asking questions and um, They've made a recommendation. Um, I, I'm, I really don't know how the why of the recommendation is going to be clear or even important. Yes, uh, Director Malloy. Madam Chair, I won't answer the question because I understand the rules you set, which are if the question is asked tonight, I'm not to answer it until the following week. And those questions that come by Wednesday are the ones that we'll answer. So I won't answer the question. We'll bring it back. And, okay, and thank you for But that. the only thing I'd like to add, if I may, because I want to be uh, as, as clear as I can that we can offer to any question a rationale for why we put something on the table. It may not answer all of your questions because you may have other interests and we need to stay out of your debate on that matter. We'll give you our perspective for why we put forward a recommendation, but if I may, you were all at your own art committee meetings and then our art committee came here. They have a rationale for why they put what they needed on the table and really our voice is not to be in the middle of it, if I may, through you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate that and, and, and uh, our job is not necessarily to um, um, 
as some people might worry, rubber stamp the staff recommendation, but rather to consider uh, the ARC committee, the staff recommendation, as well as what the public is going to say to us regarding either one of those two things. So I appreciate the issue. Thank you. Uh, any other question that hasn't been answered? Yeah. So perhaps I'll, I'll rephrase the question, and if this is how the next couple of months are going to go, this is going to be long. Don't break your time. Yeah. yeah. Your time on, that. on these scenarios that are presented, can staff in the future provide rationale on the boundaries we see on the screen for this map as well as the map above? That's one question for parts. The final question I have is clarification on the ARC recommendations, plural. Um, it was referenced that there are two recommendations. I'd like to know next week or at the next opportunity, are those in fact prioritized in a ranked order by the ARC or are they equal and um, equal options for consideration? Sorry, Trustee White, if you could repeat that. The ARC provided two recommendations. Which ARC, though? Rationale. Oh, the previous question is the one. What is the rationale of these chosen boundaries that we see on this screen? Thank you, Madam Chair. The, the, the trustee would like for us to reiterate why we chose certain boundaries in our recommendation uh, as I understand the question that's what I think is being asked because I through you madam chair if, if we didn't provide it when we gave you the recommendation we'll certainly provide it again but I don't think we would provide rationale for those scenarios that potentially trustees would be asking for because those obviously would be for you to discuss but we would certainly if need be <laughs> reiterate any rationale for why we put forward a recommendation what guiding principles it was based upon, and it may or may not answer your question because we may not use the same lens as you, which is why you have every right to do, okay. to do what I, you Okay, we may need to take this uh, piece of process off, offline just to be sure we, we understand each other. Uh, in the meantime, uh, Trustee White, you have a question? Any questions? Thank you. Did I see uh, Trustee Hicks? Okay, uh, any other questions? Yes, Trustee Orban. There. You know we have problems with boundaries. We have problems with transportation. And we're gonna be having to change policies. And boundaries, you and I know, the staff would use them to build one school and take kids out of another. What I'm trying to say is, why are we going to pinpoint what we're hoping will be the outcome by the asking trustee? Uh, sorry, well, Trustee Orban, me. this is up to the individual trustee to ask questions to get the information that they need in order to make a decision. Well, I, I don't think... It, the last time, Madam Chair, with respect, we submitted questions. And this was submitted. So, uh, so what are we saying? It was submitted... Yes, as, as we've already um, outlined in the process. I would certainly entertain a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Trustee Simmons. Do I have a seconder for that? Don't move. I'll take Trustee Glauser. All in favor? Thank you very much.